welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's me, Diana. And it's me, lovable pal, Jackie. Oh, boy, like pals. Grover. I'm like the Grover? Grover of our group. Like a furry monster? Yep. yep. Well, you know... A fun fact about our podcast about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research, in which every week we pick a topic related to the field and discuss some relevant research articles. It's a lot of work to do a podcast every week. So a lot of people don't know this, but typically what happens when we're recording is I actually have some of my favorite Sesame Street, Grover included clips playing as long as I'm talking about the podcast. So when I stop, that stops, but it keeps me going. That's why I talk so much on the show. You know, it's such an enjoyable process. And We were sort of talking about why I needed that anymore. Is it too much of a crutch? Should I probably not use that all the time? You know, I I got some Star Wars clips in there too. A lot of things I love. They just turn on when I talk. And we said, what's the science behind that? Is there a reason it works? That's what it's like inside your brain. That's what it's like inside my brain. (laughs) It's a little, yeah. (laughs) So we said, I wonder if there's any research about that. And lo and behold, we were very fortunate (laughs) to have Dr. Claudia Dozier join us to talk about a phenomenon possibly like this one I just made up for a fun introduction to the wide world of synchronous reinforcement. Claudia, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. So, so Claudia, you, you hear my predicament, right? I've got the videos playing when I talk, right? Like, it, it, is, is there a behavior analytic underpinning of what I'm talking about in my, in my hypothetical scenario there? Absolutely. The sort of umbrella term for these types of schedules are called schedules of covariation. And the type of schedule of covariation that you're referring to is a synchronous schedule of covariation. And these schedules are unique. We've done a lot of research in behavior analysis on schedules of reinforcement. Tons of literature since Furster and Skinner's 1950s work in this area. But most research on schedules of reinforcement have focused on what's been referred to as like episodic response reinforcer relations. So discrete or discontinuous responses and discrete or discontinuous reinforcing events, like in our fixed and variable ratio schedules and our fixed and variable interval schedules. So for example, a rat engages in a brief and repeated response like a lever press, and they get a brief and repeated reinforcer like a food pellet. Or in sort of our everyday world, maybe a child engages in a correct response on a skill acquisition program, and then that results in a brief access to a preferred video or game. But some researchers have called for studying more dynamic response reinforcer relations that are likely happening in our environment. And that leads to this notion of schedules covariation. And specifically in synchronous schedules covariation, what's happening there is that the onset and offset of behavior is directly covaries with the onset and offset of reinforcer access. So the dimension there that covaries is duration. The duration of the behavior covaries with the duration of a reinforcer on a moment to moment basis. So when you're talking about listening to music or talking about listening to a podcast while you're working or watching a TV show while you're exercising, what could be at play there are synchronous schedules of reinforcement. Oh, so it sounds like you are the right person to, to call <laughs> on to, to discuss this phenomenon with us. I, Every time you say phenomenon, I'm like, phenomenon. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I, have that clip. I have that clip. That's on my playlist, too. So, but Claudia, before we get too much into the nitty gritty of synchronous schedules of reinforcement or synchronous reinforcement, I should say, please tell us about yourself and how you came to want to study this, this phenomenon. I've been pretty lucky in the world of behavior analysis to be at some pretty great places at some pr- pretty great times. <laughs> so I did my undergrad degree at Florida State University with Dr. John Bailey. And then I went clear across the country and did my master's degree at University of Nevada, Reno with Jim Carr. Mm-hmm. And then I went clear back across the country to the rival Florida school, University of Florida, where I studied with both Dr. Tim Vollmer and Dr. Brian Awada. So I've been pretty lucky when it comes to the mentor department. Yeah, so that's like a who's who (laughs) of famous names in the field. Right, right. (laughs) And then after finishing up at University of Florida, I came out to the University of Kansas. I'm a professor in the Applied Behavioral Science Department here. 
And this is my 16th year, which I can't believe I'm even saying that out loud. My work here, I'm co-director of the Edna A. Hill Child Development Center on campus. And so we have two inclusion preschools, an inclusion toddler program, and a small early intensive behavioral intervention pro uh, program. And then three of my doctoral students and I also consult for a large program serving adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the Kansas City metro area. And then a couple of years ago, a colleague of mine and I got a, an NIH grant to study restrictive and repetitive behavior, particularly telehealth caregiver coaching to assess and teach individuals with autism spectrum disorder how to discriminate the conditions under which or appropriate times in which those restrictive and repetitive behaviors can occur and times when they might need to be inhibited to promote learning and, and interactions and things like that. I think that's my world. Couple Synchronous things. reinforcement. <laughs> Interestingly, I, when I was in graduate school, I worked in a facility that served group homes and day service programs that served folks with Prader-Willi syndrome. And so a major characteristic of folks that have that genetic disorder is hyperphagia, so insatiable appetite. And they're often or sed sedentary individuals have been reported to be sedentary, meaning that they don't like engaging in physical activity. A lot of us don't, but but it's particularly important for them because they will eat and eat and eat until they become very large. And that has huge health concerns for them. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was to target increasing physical activity with folks we worked with there. And we actually used a synchronous schedule of reinforcement. At the time, we called it conjugate reinforcement because we didn't know what we were mm. talking about because that's the other type of schedule of covariation. But specifically, this type is synchronous reinforcement. And this was a while back. So we actually had a video library, VHS tapes, that they could come in and pick their VHS tape <laughs> that we would then put in a VCR. And as long as they were either on a stationary bike or on a treadmill, going at the rate that was prescribed by the physician and physical therapist for them, then the video was on or the music was on, whatever they chose. If they fell below that, it went off. As soon as they got back up to there, it went back on. And we showed it was really, really effective for increasing physical activity in that population. So that's sort of when I got interested in it and started reading more about the literature and then years later, one of my doc students was interested in, you know, doing something in that area. And, and here we are. And now, now we've published two studies. We have one in review and we have four more studies ongoing right now on this topic. So Ooh, it's, oh, uh, it's, wow. it's become sort of an area of research in my lab, which, you know, it's been fun. So it's it an, an old, an old idea that you'd used in the past and sort of just came back to become yeah. something that you're becoming a focus on in the lab. That's really crazy cool. how things will work, right? <laughs> well, Dana, That's what, what my I... husband does. He always, he can't work out unless he's watching a show. Mm -hmm. I'm it's the boring. same way. It's yeah. boring I, I otherwise. Music or, or something going on. I know a lot of people also like when they're writing or when they're working, they need a podcast going on in the background or, or something going on at the same time. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely a phenomenon. Yeah. Ba, 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 da, <laughs> Oh my goodness. That's my only I, contribution. Just kidding. What, I, what, I, what I'm going to do though, is if he like starts slowing down on the bike, I'm going to come <laughs> and like turn his show off. Would that be hilarious if I like, like, right. so I was like, oh, and he's like, what are you doing? I'm going to do it. <laughs> you, it you know, I did a study on myself in college and I found that if I had music on while I was writing, I wrote three times slower than if I do that. <laughs> oh. See, I'm like that too. Like if I'm writing or doing something I really need to think about, it has to be completely silent. I can't have things going on at the same time. Yeah. So I just, yeah, I think it depends on the person and it depends on the activity. Mm -hmm. Yes. But whenever I go for walks, I always have a podcast. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So Rob, were you thinking maybe I should tell you what uh, what articles we were going to touch on? I was thinking it. On? I was thinking, and I didn't even just to say how it. how close we are, yeah. is that I was able to read your mind. So People can't see, but we're only like a couple inches away. It's, it's very amazing. And they're married. So. And we're also married. <laughs> right. yeah. Now I have the Muppets playing in my head, so it's clearly working. But Dr. Dozier has provided us with two articles that we will bring into our discussion today. They are an evaluation of synchronous reinforcement for increasing on-task behavior in preschool children, 
That's by Diaz de Viegas, Dozier, Jess, and Foley, published in Java 2020. And using synchronous reinforcement to increase mask wearing in adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities by McHugh, Dozier, Diaz de Viegas, and Kahneman. That was also published in Java 2022, conducted in 2020. <laughs> All right. So Claudia, I, you, you sort of you already sort of discussed like the key components that go into and sort of differentiate the you know schedules of covariation from kind of our typical schedules of reinforcement. You also mentioned schedules of conjugate schedules. What's the difference between a conjugate schedule of reinforcement and synchronous? Because I think there were some great examples in the paper, though I did have to read the examples a few times to understand how they weren't just kind of exactly the same, except for like maybe some minor differences. It's exactly the case, which is why we called them conjugate schedules in the first study that we did. Because, And if you read in the literature, some people lump synchronous schedules in under conjugate schedules. So there are lots of similarities. So in both schedules, a responding co-varies with reinforcement. And in both schedules, they co-vary on a moment-to-moment basis. In synchronous schedules, the dimension of behavior and reinforcement is duration, meaning that as long as the behavior is happening, the reinforcer access is there or the video is on or the music's playing. If the target behavior doesn't happen, then it goes off, right? And then if the behavior happens, it comes back again, then it goes completely on and it's at maximum intensity. Under conjugate schedules of reinforcement, other dimensions are the focus. So in a conjugate schedule, the amplitude or the intensity of the behavior directly controls some other dimension of reinforcement like the intensity or the amplitude Mm -hmm. on a moment-to-moment basis. Mm -hmm. So some of the literature on conjugate schedules of reinforcement, if if they were using TV show viewing, for example, and let's say it was physical activity was the target task, then as long as a person was pedaling at a certain speed, let's say on a stationary bike, then the TV picture is clear, not distorted, and the volume is at a preferred level. However, if they fell below that, the picture becomes distorted (coughs) or the sound goes down. And That seems like a nightmare. I know. Back up to the level, target level, is the picture again clear or in the sound at a preferred level. Does that make sense? It's like, do I have neurological problems? All this like right now, right (laughs) Right. It gets super disordered. Like, oh. Yeah. OK, gotcha. And you mentioned sort of using the synchronous schedules of reinforcement with clients with, with Prader, Prader-Willi syndrome in the past. And there were a couple of examples of other times that kind of schedules of covariation have been used in research, though there wasn't always a lot of, you know, detail. Could you mention a couple of those other studies? I know there was one with sort of like with infants looking at sort of infant preferences or that as an example? With with those schedules of covariation, there's a lot less research on schedules of covariation than on the more episodic schedules. But within schedules of covariation, the most research has been done on using conjugate schedules. But most of it has been using a conjugate schedule preparation to study some other phenomenon. So quite a bit has been used Mm -hmm. in child development, particularly in studying phenomenon in infants like infant attending behavior, infant attachment, infant motor responding, preferred types of interactions from caregivers delivered to infants. And so a lot of people have probably heard of the infant mobile paradigm, which is a conjugate reinforcement paradigm. So that's when the infant's placed in a crib, a ribbon is tied to their leg that's attached to a mobile. And so the intensity of their feet kicks or leg kicks directly produces a change in the intensity or movement of the mobile. And what they showed in a lot of that early research is this is a really good paradigm to study infant behavior because their behavior is quite responsive to this type of reinforcement paradigm rather than more episodic reinforcement like a fixed ratio schedule. And it makes sense, right? Mm -hmm because those are delayed. It's not a moment to moment change. And so that paradigm has been used a ton in in studying infant cognition, 
quite a bit in studying infant preferences. So preferences for different type of interactions from the mother. So whether the mother tickled them or poked them or the different, also to determine different types of visual preferences for infants. So they might push against a a plexiglass or something like that to be able to see certain things. So it's a paradigm that's been used a lot to study infant child development, as well as determining preferences. Lindsley was the one who originally developed the conjugate reinforcement schedule and paradigm to study various things, including advertising. So people's preferences for TV shows and their non-preferences for commercials. (laughs) And it's also been adopted to determine preferences for young children, to determine preferences for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, where they might have a micro switch where they can press certain buttons to access different types of stimuli that are auditory, visual, or tactile stimuli. So it's sort of a, a, a different paradigm. There has been a couple of recent research studies that have sort of come back around and using that paradigm with respect to studying visual and auditory stimuli in folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities, like video preferences and things like that. So hmm. quite, a, quite a bit's been done in that area. Yeah. Now, Connie, you mentioned certainly that these schedules have been seen sort of maybe as, I don't know, a tangent to or sort of an indirect, you know, indirectly used to study some other phenomenon. But I know when we were getting ready for the show and I started reading your articles, it was brought to mind this episode of of Freakonomics from a number of years ago that was all about the idea of temptation bundling, you know, and and sort of some of the examples we came up with, like, oh, you watch TV while you exercise, you listen to a podcast while you fold your laundry and do the dishes. Yet when I sort of looked at, I, I I tried to look this up a little on Google, like, is this the same type of phenomenon just with the more, you know, I don't know, advertiser ready title, maybe than synchronous reinforcement which is a lot more precise and scientific. But all I got were articles from like Business Insider and like best tips just telling me I should do this, should do it, do this thing. <laughs> and I reckon, I, you know, I, I realized kind of what you're saying. There's not a lot of necessarily research directly on this phenomenon, even though I think everyone would assume, oh, yeah, that's a thing. That's a thing that exists in the world. Of course it is. Is it just, it seems so simple. Why would you research it? Or is it just that? there's not really been a call to directly research synchronous reinforcement itself outside of those other contexts. I mean, do you kind of have a thought of, of why this is just something that's, it, that's only now kind of getting more and more and more specific directed research on, on the subject? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked this question. My colleague, Derek Reed, brought this up when we first started doing research in this area about temptation bundling. And, you know, I definitely looked into it and sort of went down the rabbit hole with respect to temptation bundling, which essentially is, you know, pairing a preferred activity with a less preferred activity. So I watch a preferred Netflix show when I work out, or I listen to a preferred audiobook when I'm working. I think there are some similarities. I have looked into the literature. So Katie Milkman does quite a bit of this research. And she does have a really good Freakonomics episode on their podcast. (laughs) And it's hard for me to determine from reading the research. There are definitely similarities, but I don't think they're the exact same thing. So a couple of things stick out to me. So in some ways, it's talked about more as if it's non-contingent reinforcement. So when you're doing this, have this available, right? Whereas in a synchronous study, if you're not doing this at a Mm -hmm. certain target level, it's paused, Mm -hmm. right? So some of her original research in this area was on increasing exercise behavior. So they use audiobooks. People could only check out the audiobook at the gym. And so they had to go to the gym to get access to the preferred audiobooks. But there was nothing to measure what they were doing at the gym. So I could go in and get my audiobook and then go get a juice at the juice bar and sit <laughs> in the corner. Or I could like, lift a weight and then <laughs> set it down. Why well, you, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's no like level of behavior that needed to happen. So lift it, it to it, my it, lap and I leave it there while I listen exactly. to the rest of the book. So, so it, and that's a really, that's really interesting because some of the things that we think about with respect to synchronous reinforcement, with respect to mechanisms by which it might be effective is it may be similar mechanisms to NCR. It may reduce the aversiveness to the more difficult or less preferred Mm. tasks, such that I'm more likely to do it, right? Although, spoiler, I don't want to take her thunder, but my current doc student, Ellie Hardesty, she did her master's thesis with Dorothy Lehrman at University of Houston, clearly comparing 
synchronous reinforcement and NCR. That paper should be coming out in Java soon, but I will do the, I will spoil it. Behavior decreased under NCR and Mm. occurred at high levels under synchronous schedules of reinforcement. So there's a little research suggesting maybe NCR is not the mechanism Mm -hmm. by which, by which it's effective. I think another thing that's really interesting about the temptation bundling is in, in, in several things that I've found on it, they talk about the notion of restricting access to the preferred activity and only using it when you have, when you have to engage in the non-preferred activity. So restricting access to your favorite Netflix shows unless you are working out at the gym. Or only listening to the audiobook when you are writing that difficult paper. Mm. And so that's really interesting too, because it'd be interesting to see is that a necessary aspect, to the efficacy of that type of procedure, right? So it's sort of this notion of response deprivation hypothesis is at play here, right? So if I restrict access to a preferred activity below baseline levels, can it then function as a reinforcer for a less preferred activity? So I'm fascinated by this temptation bundling, but I it, it's unclear if this if the degree to which they're they're similar. I, I've actually reached out to Katie and would love to chat with her about sort of her work and, you know, talk about the degree to which there's some similarities. But mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's cool. It's a good name too. So, you know, I, it's it, wonderful. It, like, <laughs> way better marketing than synchronous schedule. <laughs> right? I know Business Insider's just not writing that synchronous schedules of reinforcement uh, blog <laughs> post for anyone. <laughs> no, delete. No, thank you. Get exactly. out of my feed. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've never claimed to be particularly good at marketing things. <laughs> I, it's, you know, it's t- you're writing for Java, right? You want to be precise yeah. with your language. We right. all understand schedules of reinforcement to some extent. If not this one, yeah, 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 yeah. who's your audience, right? You know, it's not right, the business right. insider crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Our SEO for behavior analytic terminology is not so hot. I, I, I hear right. you. <laughs> so when we look at the two studies we'll be discussing today, why don't we start with the earlier study, v- Villegas? Yeah, Diaz de Villegas. De Villegas, yes. W- was this just a matter of you were just kind of thinking back on ideas and said, you know what, I remember when we used to do that experiment. Let's do something like that with a different task. Or was there a different sort of genesis of the the, 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 the procedure here? Yeah, I mean, it, this was, we never published those data with folks, part of somebody, you know how you do something and then it just kind of sits in your file cabinet. And I keep on saying, I need to pull that out and publish yeah. this data. Sarah and I started talking about it and I mean, there's just isn't much literature on using schedules of reinforcement to affect socially relevant behavior. It's hmm. typically used to study other phenomena. So this ended up being sort of a proof of com- concept study in that we were just wanting to use simple but a relevant response for our preschoolers. So it was tracing shapes on pre-printed laminated sheets. And we really wanted to focus on the utility of synchronous schedules for behavior change. And we wanted to compare it sort of to a control condition where they could still earn access to the same reinforcer. We used music in that study, but it wasn't on a synchronous schedule. So we ended up using sort of a modified accumulated schedule where they could accumulate the duration of access to the music, but at the end of the session. Mm-hmm. So that was our, our control condition. And then we wanted to see not only compare those and determine the efficacy of the synchronous schedule for on-task behavior tracing, but we wanted to see, do the kids prefer it? So is it more preferred than the accumulated schedule? So that's sort of the, what we decided to do. Hey, everybody. Sorry to pause the conversation, but we're going to take a little break. We will be right back talking about synchronous reinforcement with Dr. Claudia Dozier. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure. We all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. 
and our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu, regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there! And we are back talking with Dr. Claudia Dozier about synchronous reinforcement. But before we do that, I have to interrupt just a little longer to share our Secret code words, yes, because by listening to this show, you are able to earn one learning credit because ABA and Setrack is Ace and Quaba approved. All you need to do is finish listening to the show, then head to our website, abainsidetrack.com, or click the link in the show notes description on your podcast player to enter in some information about yourself, as well as two secret code words. These secret code words are from our guest, Dr. Dozier, and the first of those is beach, B-E-A-C-H. It's a sandy or rocky area right next to an ocean. Beach. All right, and now let's get back to our discussion. How did you all come up with that idea of, like, we'll just have kids, and they're either tracing paper or messing around, and they'll either have music playing, or they'll be told, the music will come later. Do your work first. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, a simple we idea, but, have, you know. <laughs> we wanted to have that comparison control condition, sort of another schedule, but that provided the same duration or, you know, of, of reinforcement, but that it was more delayed. You know, it's interesting because in the study were, none of the kids had diagnoses. These mm-hmm. were all what, what folks might call typically developing kids. And when I first came to KU, that was really the first time I had worked, started working with typically developing kids. And you learn a lot. I learned a lot really quick coming from a history of working with individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's a whole new ball game working, <laughs> running research yeah. with typically developing kids. Because like we might talk about later, they make up their own rules and they create, they try to figure out what you're trying to do and this, that, and the other. So they've shaped our behavior over the past 16 years with respect to how to how to set up these sessions. So we wanted to pick a task that wasn't an acquisition task. So it's not like they're learning anything, but it's a task that's relevant to preschoolers. And we wanted to see, does providing a synchronous schedule of reinforcement promote them engaging in that work task? We set it up sort of as a concurrent situation where they could either engage with the work task and get the music, or you can draw over here. Here's some laminated sh- blank sheets and a marker you can draw instead. There's something else for you to do if you don't want to work. Mm-hmm. That's how we sort of landed upon how to set those sessions up. Claudia, was there a pilot where you just tried it with just the, either the tracing or, or vacuum, like nothing happened, and maybe the first participant was hiding under the table a little too long? You say, we need a different so, activity. I tell you, in our studies, we always have an alternative task particularly with typically developing kids. And that was one of lessons learned uh, early on in working with typically developing kids because they're under such instructional control. But a lot of times they'll do anything that an adult tells them to do in baseline, unless there's something else to do. Or like you said, they're bouncing off the walls, <laughs> right? They're, they're creating their own little activities to do. Yeah, like under the table, picking up things or, you know, doing random other things. So we pretty much in all of our studies always have an alternative task. There's something else that they can do. Mm-hmm. It's a good question. <laughs> that was definitely a lesson learned, though. I'm like, what is going on? These kids will just do anything <laughs> like we right. ask them to do. It, 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 it is a funny phenomenon how the vast majority of children just you tell them do something and they just kind of do it for for a long time, long enough that you're like, well, you've just blown my baseline, kid. Thanks for nothing. You know, right, right. So you've got the kids all picked sort of their favorite songs based on songs that you were hearing in the preschool. I, I did like that detail. In the st- <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's the hot song here at the preschool? You know, Baba it's Black funny Sheep though, Big. If you, it's, you, know. if you ask my graduate students, and my undergraduate students, like they got so sick of certain songs because the kid like frozen was really big yeah. at mm-hmm. this time. And I think my graduate students were like, if I hear another song from frozen movie, <laughs> I'm going to go and sing. <laughs> <laughs> they're all picking frozen. Uh. 
It's I, I did it. I think it won an Oscar. That that score must have won an Oscar. So. It's right, right. Let right. it go. So, I think yeah, that's you know. a, that's a yeah. Big yeah. Let it go. Choices <laughs> could be that like gummy bear song. Do you guys know that the one? gummy bears? Is it the one that I like from the eighties? No, gummy Mm-mm. bears. No, that's the that's the TV no. show. Yeah, that is something else. Oh. Yeah. On Disney Plus now. Or right, the shark it, song. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, baby shark. Oh. That's baby still shark. popular and still annoying. Uh, so yeah. other choices. <laughs> yeah, I'll take Frozen. So bad. I take Frozen by the egot day. winning uh, the egot winning songwriting team of, of Lopez and Lopez. Yeah, I'll take that over Baby Shark. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they had their choice of songs. They chose. I think they usually made like a playlist or or, or had three like on an iPad, sort of available to play. And then it was either. So we were low tech hmm? in the initial oh, study. Oh, okay. Got the boom box, the big boom box uh, for the kids. It was it was a <laughs> poster board. Mm-hmm. Oh. So we had pictures that were associated with each one of the songs, with the name of the song underneath that, and we showed them this large picture board, and they could point to whichever song or say whichever song they wanted. So in that initial study, it was it was low tech, mm-hmm. so anybody can do this. You don't even need an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> But that that actually makes me feel better because I, you know, like when I'm meeting with my students and they're like, I want to do this research. I'm like, oh, but we don't have any money, but we would. It would be OK. Right. It would be fine. Right. Exactly. And we I actually that. wrote that as a limitation when because this was Sarah's master's thesis. Mm-hmm. We wrote that as a limitation in the results, the discussion section and at her master's thesis committee defense, like three of the faculty were like. That is not a limitation. Right. Like that's actually a positive thing because yeah. anybody can do this. You don't mm-hmm. need technology to do it. And I was like, oh, I didn't think about it that way. Yeah. yeah. So you've got the kids. They've got the two piles of paper. I'm imagining these giant stacks of paper. You've got your trace sheets and you've got your pieces of paper and they got uh, markers or I can't remember some sort of writing implement. Right. And it was trace right. or not trace, depending on the condition. Right. And you were just sort of looking at how long they were on 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 task with, on task. with well, either of the tasks. And in one condition, it's just songs, songs, songs playing over. And oh, okay, I could, yeah, just saying it out loud, I can definitely see how the students got sick of it. <laughs> but then, what was the what was the rule in the other one? Because I know this sort of became you sort of hinted at it. It did become a problem for at least one of your participants, sort of not understanding mm-hmm. the contingencies at play. So the other way you described it to the kids was when it wasn't synchronous. And we did do pre-session exposure too. So we had them engage in the behavior and then experience whatever the contingency was that was programmed. So in the accumulated condition, we explained to them that for however long you trace during the session, at the end of the session, you'll get to listen to your songs that you chose. Mm-hmm. And then they, we did sort of forced exposure to the contingencies and then we con- conducted the session and yeah, one of our kids in that study, Graham, he initially was showing because we used a we used a multi-element design, so it was rapidly alternating the accumulated and the synchronous condition. He was showing similar levels, which isn't a problem. I mean, we actually thought we'd get more kids that would show similar levels across those two conditions, and which wasn't a problem. But the problem was that he would interrupt the experimenter, the graduate students, when they were giving the rules and be like, no, 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 this is the rule. No, This is the blue. So we had different discriminative stimuli associated, color-coded stimuli associated with the different conditions. And you guys were like, I like red today, so I'm going to work. Or he would just make up different things that he was going to do or not do that had nothing to do with the contingencies that we were programming. So we had to do additional training with Graham. Mm. At least he had the decency to, to to verbalize what rule he was making up. So you you, yes. you you actually knew, oh, okay, this kid's just messing with us as opposed to like, what? Right. The results are all over the place. What's going on with this participant? Right. And see, that's my favorite part of conducting research. When things don't work out as planned and problems come up like this, I think that's my favorite part of the process is trying to problem solve and address those things. And I always tell my graduate students, I'm like, this is the fun part. This is science. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they agree with me, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, Claudia, you you have, have these conditions. Graham got a little, I think he had a little reteaching of, of the, yeah. the little discrimination training to sort of yeah. get him get him to understand exactly what was being looked for. <laughs> what were your general results with the with the preschoolers? Because I know you mentioned they weren't exactly what you were expecting in terms of the, the kind of the magnitude of, of which schedule turned out to be preferred. 
Yeah, so we had eight kids in this study. Seven of the eight kids, the synchronous schedule resulted in consistently higher levels of on-task behavior than the accumulated condition. For one kid, both were pretty much equally effective levels over baseline. And then for those seven of eight kids also chose synchronous schedules over accumulated schedules in that concurrent chains preference assessment. The outlier, the the one child who showed similar levels in the accumulated and the synchronous schedule kind of flipped back and forth between choosing those in the preference assessment. Mm -hmm. So there was no clear preference between the two. Okay. So, and and I know being, you know, a proof of concept study, I'm sure that that, that when you were done, it was, you know, already you were thinking, okay, well, you know, what could we have done differently? How is this going to look in the, in the next time? What were some of kind of the big takeaways from, from, you know, this initial study? So I think one of the things that we really started thinking about is why, <laughs> why it was synchronous reinforcement more effective than accumulated reinforcement. So like, there are a couple of things. One is in the synchronous schedule, reinforcement's more immediate. I mean, in the accumulated schedule, it's delayed. I mean, not only is it more immediate, it co-varies with the behavior. So moment to moment uh, immediacy. Another potential mechanism is the response cost aspect of it. So when they were not engaging in the target response, the the music was paused. And so removal of the music may have influenced the the occurrence of behavior. And it can sort of function as feedback, Mm. right? Within session feedback with respect to whether they were doing the task correctly. And then sort of the combination of those things, those moment to moment changes in the reinforcer access during the synchronous schedule may have just been a more robust contingency, right? More salient with respect to the task. And then the other one was sort of the NCR thing, right? So when they were working, what it was having music available, did it decrease the aversiveness of the task itself? And so one of the things that we were really, you know, talking a lot about is why we got these results and what the potential mechanisms might be. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that in, in, you know, when we submitted this manuscript, we got some feedback from the reviewers about the accumulated schedule. So even though we set it up as sort of a control condition, there was feedback suggesting that this isn't really how accumulated schedules are programmed in the real world. Mm -hmm. So in accumulated schedules, there's typically some within session condition reinforcer delivery, like tokens, Mm -hmm. to show the accumulation within session reinforcement and to show the accumulation of the delayed backup reinforcer, right? And we didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And so interestingly, my... Sarah, who conducted this study for her thesis, that's what she did in her dissertation. So, uh, um, and she's about to submit that for publication. So she compared synchronous schedules accumulated just like we did here. The third condition was accumulated with tokens. Wow. So God. there was sort of that within session feedback. And I'll share, even though <laughs> it's not published yet. <laughs> We saw similar results. Hmm. Synchronous schedules were more effective than the, those other two schedules for most of the kids in that study. Also, even that they accumulated with tokens mm-hmm. condition. So, yeah. which was sort of again surprising to us. It was also more preferred. So, mm-hmm. something to do with that di- dynamic contingency. It's very interesting. Yeah. I I think you also mentioned too, though, in the paper that one of the you know, the, the idea that the child child had to, with the accumulated condition, had to sort of wait till the end and then just like hang out and stay in the space for yeah. longer to hear. So, which... so essentially, from a molar perspective, the session time was longer. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. So there's more bang for your buck in the synchronous condition where you could, you stay in the session room less time, you get the reinforcer while you're doing the work task. There wasn't anything to suggest that the kids didn't want to be in the session room. Like all the kids love coming to research and yeah. you know one to one interaction and that kind of stuff. So I don't really know if that's a factor, but I mean it's it's something to consider. There is definitely less time in the session room. Well, we also thought that maybe kids would prefer the accumulated condition. Some kids would prefer the accumulated condition because they could listen to the music without having to engage in the task. So there's yeah. a flip side of it is like having to work while music is on. Does that make music less preferred mm-hmm. <laughs> such that I'll just do my work and then I get to listen to music without having to do some tasks. But we didn't get that for most yeah. folks. I was going to say, I wonder if it would be different if the 
synchronously available task or a reinforcer was a visual versus an auditory, right? So then you'd have to look at the, like to get the full effect of a video, you look at the screen, but you can't also draw while you're looking exactly. at the screen, mm-hmm. right? And, and that's, a, that's sort of one of the considerations for the use of synchronous schedules or conjugate schedules is you can't use them for all responses. Yeah. You can't use them for all reinforcers, right? Mm-hmm. Not, not all reinforcers lend themselves to being delivered in that kind of format. And so that, that's definitely a, a limitation of using that kind of paradigm. So we move forward to to the next publication, the the McHugh study, and I, I, I it's kind of funny. It, you go from proof of concept study to okay, we're going to use this in, in in the real world, and and I sort of was was curious. Was this a matter of just I think synchronous reinforcement matches up with a lot of the problems we're seeing in a lot of the research coming out about increasing mask wearing? Because let's all flash back, folks. I know we don't want to, but let's think back to 2020, 2021. You couldn't throw a rock without hitting an article about increasing mask wearing in various populations. Was it just something like, I think this matches better to, to the phenomenon and I think it will be effective? It was just, we've got a group and they have not been receptive to a lot of the other types of treatments. Let's give this a whirl, a little bit of of both sort of where did this come from? Cause it was kind of a jump from proof of concept to, all right, we're using this in the real world. Yeah. And it was definitely serendipity at its finest. Mm-hmm. So we started this study early on in the pandemic. So none of the math studies have been published mm. at that point in time. And we did a literature review to try to, because the company came to us and said, we have all these adults, adults that won't wear masks. They live in concrete care. They have people coming in and out of their houses all the time. They have all of the, you know, a lot of people have like immune you know, disorders and it were very at risk. And so we did a quick lit review and there were various procedures that seemed to be relevant. So studies had been done on increasing wearing prosthetics. So like glasses or increasing and wearing other medical devi- devices, so like a CPAP machine or a medical alert bracelet. And one of the common interventions that's used is a differential negative reinforcement of, our, of other behavior, so a DNRO procedure. So we tried that. So for <clears throat> as long as they were wearing the mask for a very short amount of time, we, 15 seconds, they would get a break and access to preferred activity. And then we tried to increase that schedule. For one person who had pretty good rule governance, good listener repertoire, that was effective. For a couple of other people we tried that with, it was not. And the biggest issue was removal of the preferred item activity evoked problem behavior. And so we were like, okay, that's not going to work. And none of these episodic schedules are going to work under these conditions. And so I was like, let's do SSR. It's a non-episodic schedule. They, they drive the access to the reinforcer. As long as they have the mask on, they have it. If they take it off, they got to put it back on to get it, right? And they can mm-hmm. get it immediately. So yeah, we pivoted and evaluated SSR and it, it worked really, really well. <laughs> Amazingly. I mean, it was, it was, it was definitely serendipity. So, so a lot of the intro components of the, the final write-up, the final research paper write-up sort of came after the fact of the research having already been done or finishing finishing up. I always, okay, I always love asking that question because it's one of those things, you read the research in your context is, well, I assume this research got done yesterday and sort of magically was published today, right? But right. They, when, when you're asked, it's like, how oh, it took years, or these are the questions, <laughs> or we had to get that other participant. And that adds a lot, I think, to that context of where did the study come from? Why this way? Why that? So thank yeah, you for, we, for sharing. We started it before any of that the mask studies had been published way before. Hmm. I, I'm a little surprised then that no one else had thought of a different schedule of reinforcement because I know I read plenty of those studies as I think we all did, you know, during the, the height of the pandemic and it always kind of had the same, what's well, going to be the rule governed behavior. Maybe we're going to do escape extinction, something with prompts, like a DRA proceed. Right. You know, they, they all read very similarly. A lot of them used a graduated exposure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's an important point. One of the things in this mask study that really did lend itself to the use of the synchronous schedule is that all of these participants would wear the mask for a very short period of time. Mm-hmm. We didn't have any in this study that wouldn't wear it at all. Mm. But if you have someone who will not even put it on, 
then you do need to do some desensitization or graduated exposure to get them to even put it on to experience the reinforcement contingencies. So a lot of them use that graduated exposure like steps within the context of it, and which is a great procedure. It's used in a lot of health and hygiene routines as well um, for tolerance to those routines. But it takes a long time. <laughs> yes. And we got to get these people to wear masks now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, you know, decided not to go that route. Well, I think the other point you bring up in the study, too, was just the goal was to wear a mask so that they could participate more more actively as well as 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 just the, the general health of being in their in their home setting and having all the people coming in and out. And when you're looking at results of wear the mask for up to five minutes, what, you're not going to go anywhere in five right. minutes. Like you go outside and come right back in in about five minutes. So that needing to have something that can be robust in terms of the duration of mask wearing afterwards. Absolutely. And interestingly, my doc student, Stacia Leslie, she replicated Katie McHugh's study on the using SS, the synchronous schedule for mask wearing. She replicated it with our kids. And she's a, she, she just submitted that, that study to Java. She replicated with kids that were around two years of age. So when the Centers for Disease Control decreased the age to two years old, we had quite a few kids in the Child Development Center that were not wearing masks yeah. and were resistant to do it. And she found that synchronous schedules were very effective with them too, except for one kid who would not wear the mask at all. So we did have to do the desensitization procedure with them. And what we ended up doing was we found things in that child's classroom that in the dramatic play area and stuff like that, that involved putting things on their head, around their ears, around mm -hmm. their neck. So like a play boa and a hat and play sunglasses. And we use that to increase the likelihood of tolerance of things going on the head and face uh -huh. while using the synchronous schedule. So we killed two birds with one stone, got her used to putting things on her head and face and experience with the synchronous schedule. Yeah. And then we were able to fade in the mask mm -hmm. so and get her up to 30 minutes as well wearing the mask. So we did have to use a sort of graduate exposure desensitization procedure with, with one participant. So in terms of this study, was it informed at all by the by the previous study with preschoolers or was this really just came from the medical literature, some of your own background? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely informed by by that that initial study, just like how effective it was and how quick we got effects for sort of an on task behavior. And we're like, really, how different is that than tolerating wearing a mask? And we also knew, based on you know information and observations, that media was very reinforcing for these adults with IDD. And they had very specific preferences. Certain music videos were very preferred. <laughs> certain TV shows, very preferred. And so we thought these are going to be robust reinforcers. And so it seems logical to, to use it within the context of a synchronous schedule. And it, and it worked really well. Mm -hmm. But in terms of setup, it was pretty similar. You had kind of a sense of you know, what they would like to watch, made your playlists, everything yeah. available, a little more high tech, but everything was... A little more know, high tech. They got to choose it from a iPad. <laughs> <laughs> Everything available. And then as long as the mask is on, playlist goes, mask comes off, playlist pause, you know, prompts. I know I know you counted prompts. We did you know. add prompts for this because we wanted to increase the likelihood that they would come into contact with the contingency. So in this one, and a lot of these folks had less of a listener repertoire, uh, less rule governance. And so we added prompts, but we measured them to see, did the prompts decrease? And, and they did mm -hmm. um, for, for most folks. Yeah. Would you mind talking about the results? Because I mean, overall, they were very, very positive, though. I think there were some 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 sort of patterns that were very, very interesting, maybe not quite as clear in some regards as the sure. preschool study. We were able to increase mask wearing for all, I think there were five adults in this study, for, for all of the participants for up to 30 minutes. An interesting thing that came along for the ride is for most folks, we also saw a decrease in problem behavior. And we didn't program problem behavior in the contingency. And so that was a really cool added effect with the use of the synchronous schedule. And then we assessed generalization. So what we really wanted to do is see, can we remove the synchronous schedule? Because we're not, we're not going to probably be able to run that when people are going out into the community. So, And for most people, we saw generalization. I mean, generalization sessions were under pretty much under baseline conditions where staff were kind of talking to them, but there was no media access. The rules were in place or the prompts were in place, mm -hmm. but none of the synchronous reinforcement contingency was in place. 
And for quite a few of the folks, we saw generalization. And so that makes you wonder what was happening. So was it habituation that occurred? So that pairing of something really preferred, now the mask wear, mask isn't aversive anymore, right? Did the prompts, you know, now have stimulus control over responding because of their pairing with the media? So yeah, we, you know, we had some questions as to why we would potentially get generalization. So yeah, it's Those an interesting outcome. Questions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wonder if you went like, you know, went to just like a an earbud with the audio from the video and if that then it's portable, right? You can like you can listen to your I that's true. Called? Ear yep. pods, I, Air- AirPods. <laughs> right. It sounds the so other crazy. question is, could you move from a synchronous schedule to an NCR schedule for yeah. maintenance? Yeah. Right. So and one of my doc students, Ellie Hardesty, is looking at that right now. So one of the things about synchronous schedules is they're very robust. They, you know, right. can change behavior pretty quickly, but most environments don't have a staffing ratio <laughs> to be able to support ongoing synchronous mm-hmm. schedules of reinforcement. And so if if you don't get maintenance when SSR is removed, how do you continue to have behavior change without conducting synchronous schedules of reinforcement? So she's looking at some ways to maintain those effects. So one thing is, can you maintain the effects within CR after a history with synchronous schedules? Or maybe you need to do a booster at the beginning of a period of time that are synchronous and then you can move to NCR. And so she's looking at different ways where you can potentially fade that if removal of the synchronous schedule doesn't result in maintenance. Mm -hmm. So I I think that's a really important important area. Yeah, Yeah. really fascinating. Because it's like during the pandemic, it's like, this is all that matters right now. Right. You have to wear the mask. Like, put everything, all your efforts into that. You right. can watch as many videos as you want. But right. that's that was like a singular point in time where that was the case. And now there's not such a clear cut focus on mm-hmm. all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, Claudia, I, I know we've still got a, a couple of good questions that I, that I, I'd, I'd love to discuss. And you've already started bringing up some of them. But since a lot of them have to do with the future, it's probably a good time for us to move into the next segment of the show, the dissemination station. Jack, do it again, it Jack. It didn't, co- it didn't come in. It was a silent what? train. It was too silent? It was too okay. silent. <laughs> I, I don't, we're losing, okay. I don't know, we're losing the train. Okay, that's okay. We're on a maglev train today, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, Claudia, you already started kind of discussing kind of what's next for looking at research and schedules of synchronous reinforcement. And you kind of mentioned a few of the limitations a little earlier, but it does seem like there's going to have to be some real cleverness to looking at a couple of the concepts because otherwise one could find themselves like, where do you study schedules, uh, synchronous schedules of reinforcement? People's exercise routines, their laundry folding routine. It kind of just seems like that's sort of going to be where where you end up because of some of the limitations of, you you know, how do you set up, how do you set up the technology to have reinforcement delivered only when the behavior is occurring and turn off only when the behavior is no longer, uh, you know, occurring. Just seems very hard to sort of have to keep thinking outside the box to make to make that happen in socially significant ways. Agreed. Agreed. And we've been talking a lot about that and we've been trying to sort of press the boundaries and sort of think about the limitations of the technology. We talked about, I think, in one of the papers about application within the context of a group contingency. So one of my doc students, Kai Kahneman, is actually wrapping us up a study on that right now. Mm -hmm. And so we are doing that in the Child Development Center. And we're using synchronous schedules to increase group cleanup behavior after playtime in the preschool. Kids hate cleaning up, right? Mm -hmm. And the cleanup song doesn't do it. Just singing the cleanup song (laughs) doesn't do it. So we're doing it within the context of an interdependent group contingency. And we're using small groups, so four or five kids and replicating it across small groups to begin with before we throw it in the classroom. And our results so far have suggested that it's effective with most kids. So as long as everybody's cleaning up whatever song they chose collectively, so Mm -hmm. another group contingency is they have to choose the song together, they get access to. If anybody in the group stops cleaning up, then the music pauses. And for the most part, the majority of kids are cleaning up to access the music. 
like any fun research project, there are some outliers and there's some kids that are like, no, today I want to play instead and I'm not cleaning up and I'm going to try to get my friends to do it with me, which is similar to other group contingency research, right? Sometimes you have an outlier. Mm. You have to so we've had to do some additional training or some additional modifications or contingencies for those kids. But in general, we've seen it work within the context of, uh, of a group contingency. And I see quite a lot of application for this, particularly in classrooms or group homes. So it, within the context of a group contingency. So transitions are a big problem in preschool environments. There's a lot of transitions and there's a lot of junk that happens in transitions. <laughs> so programming in a group SSR contingency for transitions, following the rules during transitions, or implementing it during a group mealtime behavior, as long as everybody's sitting, keeping their hands to themselves and you know, following the mealtime behavior rules, right? Access to preferred media can be provided. So I see some applications there. My doc student, Katie McHugh, is actually extending her, the mask study, by looking at the use of synchronous schedules during health and hygiene tasks. Hmm, So tooth brushing, face care, some of the adults with intellectual development disabilities require like certain physical therapy procedures. So tolerating those, wearing a pulse ox monitor, So those types of things. So just trying to increase the breadth of behaviors that we can apply or evaluate synchronous schedules for. We're also in that study looking at, in addition to the tolerance behavior and problem behavior, we're also looking at consumer affect. So we're going to measure consumer affect in baseline and under SSR conditions to see, do you see more positive affect or at least less negative affect? under synchronous schedule conditions as compared to baseline conditions. Oh. It's like my dentist. That's, that's some of the projects we have going on. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this area of research. It's kind of sparked some, some serious excitement and conversations in my lab. So it's fun when you know you yeah. get excited about sort of a new area. Well, and, and it feels too Claudia, like, especially in, in a classroom setting, if you can provide sort of the low the low hanging fruit of just turn the music on that the kids like when you need X to happen and, yeah. and magic, they'll all do it. No problems or minor problem. You know, maybe a few kids here or there won't. And here's what you do then. Those do sound like the types of strategies that will get adoption much quicker than what if we had this elaborate token economy, game system or token economy. Yeah. I think teachers are excited about those too, but at the same time, it is like, that's one more thing. That's like one more, I have one more thing. I'll, I'll hit play. I can hit play. No problem. <laughs> That's easy. Tell me, tell me there's research to support that one. I'll do it. I'll add that in. <laughs> my, in response to thinking about the hygiene tasks, like my dentist, it used to be that when you went there, they always had a little TV and they would always play HGTV. Like it was always like fix it or flip it or like one of those right. shows. And I like really looked forward to it. And then they stopped having the TV on for some reason, but it was uh-huh. nice to have that. Maybe you stopped. Synchronous reinforcement available. You, you weren't taking good enough care of your teeth, so the TV didn't You're turn right. on. Right. That maybe. was the problem. But oh, they forgot maybe. to tell you the contingency. Oh. You don't have to know the contingency for it to be effective. That's true, but if you don't contact reinforcement, how will you ever learn the contingency? <laughs> my my periodontist uses that, so I, I, I do have gum issues, and I've had several surgeries, and they have an iPod, and you can choose from movies or choose music to listen to while they're doing the surgery. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean... It, definitely some temptation bundling going on uh, going on there, right? <laughs> ah, ah, well, speaking of, of bundling things, mm-hmm. let's move into the last section of our show. Pairings. This is a new last section, Claudia. We've only been doing it for a couple, couple like a month, a couple months now. A couple months, I think. So. But it's it's all all in line with the idea of what what well you describe it then. Sure. So the idea here is that we've had so many different episodes now that some of our listeners might not know older episodes that we have touched on potentially similar topics. So in pairings, I review with everyone past episodes that if this sort of sparked their interest, they might want to go back and revisit some of those or listen to those for the first time. And then I also suggest a snack that I personally feel like fits with the episode. And That's cool. Not okay. based on anything except my own. But you can't eat the snack unless you're listening unless you're to engaging talk in about research right. or right. you're reading the research yourself. Unless you're cleaning your kitchen. 
Or exactly. Clean your kitchen. Yes. exactly. Pick so, a behavior and, the, and, and it's, it's synchronous. So we've never talked about this exact topic <laughs> before. No. So what I tried to do is just amass some different times in which we've talked about the ways in which reinforcement schedules operate differently under different potential conditions. Mm-hmm. And so if you're interested in hearing more about that, you could go in the way, 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 way back machine to episode number six. Ooh. Oh. Which we discuss pre-session pairing with Dr. Amanda Kelly. Oh, that's a good one. I've listened to that one. It's oh a my goodness. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. That's so cool. You could hop I, over. I also have assigned that one to my undergraduate students in my undergrad class. Oh, oh yeah. Cool. There you go. You know, I mean, Claudia, awesome. a fun behind the scenes fact about that is we did not know how to use multiple microphones when we recorded it. So we had to jerry rig some sort of daisy chain of mm-hmm. headphones and not everyone could talk at she one was time our first guess. it was very hard That's awesome <laughs> yeah. so. you've come a long way i know <laughs> <laughs> let me see you could that you could, microphone uh, you have right there is extremely fancy oh thank you oh, this, yeah. this is an old staller we've had this one for a very long time it's it's a good one for for the distance recording it doesn't take as much time to set up but yes yeah. we love it's we like, love like, our bikes. Got like a retro vibe to my yeah. too. you could listen to episode 20 on non-contingent reinforcement you could, if you wanted to, listen to Dr. Derek Reed talk about behavioral economics in episode 126. <laughs> yes. like, I guess you could listen to, <laughs> guess you could listen to Dr. Reed. To. <laughs> you could. I also threw in component analyses in there, which is episode 132, because we do some of this same type of breakdown. And you could listen to episode 162, which is tummy time, because we talk some about some of that potentially related infant research. And then finally, you could hop over and listen to episode 195, which was under the hood of token economies with Dr. Jason Bray, which is just mind blowing, to be honest, <laughs> the way in which he yeah. discusses reinforcement schedules. So he's mm-hmm. a great dude. I love yes, him. Yes. Oh, yeah. So any of those- grad school together. I thought, I thought you <laughs> oh, might yeah, you when you yeah. reviewed your you know family tree there. That, that <laughs> right. might have been the case. So then, it, you know, to, to pair with these, you might enjoy a snack. And I actually wrote down a bunch of different things before I picked the one that I thought was the best. So, Jackie, I don't know if you remember. So, Jackie and I used to be roommates a long we time did. ago in we a did house a long that time neither ago. of us owned the furniture in. Yep. But one of the things that was in this house, in the kitchen, was a mug that had little teddy bears on it. And the, the phrase on the mug, do you remember this, Jackie? Yep. Yeah. The phrase on the mug said, why have bread and water when you could have toast and tea? And I you wanted loved that mug. It I was, loved that mug so much. I wanted to take it with me when we moved, but it wasn't actually mine. Oh. But I feel like it maps on nicely to this episode, right? Because you could just have bread and water, but why not enhance it and make it into toast and tea? And that's set. awesome. The snack is toast and tea. So just constantly be <laughs> drinking tea and shoving toast in your mouth and you can get anything done. <laughs> It's what we've learned today. Well, maybe not, but you know, <laughs> it's a, it's a Don't start. talk with your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Claudia Doja, thank you so much for coming on and talking all about synchronous reinforcement. Like Diana said, not a topic we've ever discussed. And I think one that really resonates. I, I'm so glad it's sparking so many fun ideas already uh, because I'm going to be very curious to ha- have a sequel discussion about kind of what comes out and what we learn more about this type of reinforcement schedule. It's very exciting. Mm-hmm. If folks are interested in emailing you either with their own ideas of how synchronous reinforcement could be used or to ask to get, you know, get more information about this line of research, is there a place that they could contact you? Sure. Yeah. You can just email me. My university email is cdozier, D-O-Z-I-E-R at K-U dot E-D-U. Thank you so much for listening to ABA Inside Track. And thanks so much to Dr. Claudia Dozier for coming on the show. We hope you enjoyed it. There are a couple ways that you can follow ABA Inside Track. Certainly, you can subscribe to us on your podcast player of choice. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. It's wherever you get your podcasts. You can go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, to find links to all of our previous episodes, links to the articles discussed in this and other episodes, and to purchase CEs. You can go to our YouTube page where all of these episodes are posted with the YouTube subtitling feature. You can find us on all the socials as ABA Inside Track. 
And if you want even more ABA Inside Track content, as well as some fun bonuses, you can subscribe to us as well on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where for $5 a month, you can get all of our episodes a week ahead of time, and you can get access to our quarterly live events, including a corresponding free CE. We have a great live event coming out that we're going to be recording at Regis College for the Babbitt Student Group on transitioning to being a professional BCBA. So that's coming out very soon, as well as access to all of our previous live episodes and access to future live episodes. You'll also, if you want to subscribe at the $10 level, get access to our Extra Long Quarterly Book Club podcast worth two CEs each. At the time of this release, you just missed our discussion of the skeptical data review book Calling Bullshit, where we talked for up two hours all about that topic, as well as all of our previous catalog of book clubs and live episodes and discounts at the CE store. Again, that's patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. Some big thanks before we wrap up to Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, Kyle Sturry for his interstitial music, and Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for his amazing editing work. And don't think I forgot that second secret code word. Here it is. It's vacation. V-A-C-A-T-I-O-N. It's that time of year where you get away from it all and do something or go somewhere fun. Or it is the second album by the band The Go-Go's. Either way, vacation. We'll be back next week with another full-length episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye!